Well, we're into the second stage of the journey that we've called the Inside Story. We began looking at the inside story of human life, and we have progressed to look at the inside story of the Christian life. What do you make of the Christian life? How do you find tying together what the Bible says about it and your own experience of it? If you're a Christian, you've died to sin, but if you're like me, you probably find that sin is pretty much alive towards you. Its presence is obvious. I wonder if you've noticed the contradictions in your own Christian life. Um, you love Christ, so why is it then that you're drawn to sin? Uh, you trust Christ, so why is it then that you struggle with so many fears and so many anxieties? I don't know about you, but I often find that I am a mystery to myself. Do you find that about your Christian life? You think, now, I, I don't fully understand exactly what's going on inside of me as a Christian. Well, that's the reason why we're looking at the inside story of the Christian life, so that we can get a better handle on what it means to be a Christian, and if you're not yet a Christian, what it would be like, what you could expect if you were to become a Christian even today. Well, maybe you have struggled to hold together um, your own experience and some of the things that the Bible says about being a Christian. You know, you read about uh, joy, and you read about peace, and you read about all of these things in the Holy Spirit, uh, God working with you, Ephesians 1, with the same power that He exercised in raising Jesus Christ from the dead, and you think, I'm just trying to get through a course at college, you know? I'm just trying to raise a family. I'm, I'm just trying to find a job here. Uh, I'm just trying to struggle with a sickness here, and uh, my life doesn't seem quite so grand as all of that. Well, I hope you'll open your Bible today at Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. I want to draw your attention to what I think is one of the greatest statements about the Christian life in all of the Bible. To me, it has been one of the most profoundly helpful in all of the New Testament. Many of you will be familiar with it. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, we read these words, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Uh, Spurgeon says about this verse, uh, quote, your life as a Christian is a very strange one. I am crucified, nevertheless I live. How do you hold these two things together? What a contradiction, he says. The Christian's life is a matchless riddle. No worldly person can comprehend it, and even the believer himself cannot fully understand it. He knows it, but solving all its enigmas, he feels to be an impossible task. Matthew Henry, the great Puritan commentator, also comments on what he calls the mysterious life of the Christian believer that you've died and that yet you live. That you live, and yet Paul says here, yet it is not I who lives, it is Christ who lives in me. And then he says that we're crucified with Christ, and yet Christ lives in us. Well, there's the enigma, there's the mystery, there's why it's pretty difficult sometimes to make sense of what's going on in your own experience as a Christian. And our purpose today is to look into this mystery as we explore the inside story of the Christian life. I do hope then that your Bible is open here, because for all of the mystery of this verse, I've got to tell you, I have found this verse of Scripture to be more helpful than any other for getting a handle on the experience of the Christian life. And I want to draw your attention to two statements in this verse that I have found personally to be so very, very helpful. They're right in the middle there. Do you notice that Paul describes the Christian life in two ways? First, he says, the Christian life is a life that is lived in the body, the life that I live in the body. And then secondly, he describes this life that is lived in the body as a life lived by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So, here are two 
uh, touchstones of the Christian life. Here are two handles, as it were, that you can get on the Christian life. The Christian life is lived in the body, and the Christian life is by faith in the Son of God. These two statements will give you a firm handle on the Christian life as it is in the Bible and as you will experience it every day of your walk with Christ. Your Christian life is lived in the body. And what that means is that you will always feel the pull of the flesh as long as you live in this world. You will find that there are times when you lack courage. There are times when you lose heart. You will find times when you lament your own failure. You may experience sickness you will experience at some point weakness. Uh, eventually, if Christ has not come within the span of your lifetime, you will, like the vast majority of other believers, experience death itself. On the way there, you may experience depression. On the way there, you may experience anxiety, doubt, feelings of inadequacy, uh, loneliness, all of this flows from the reality that Paul states here that we live the Christian life in the body in this physiological reality. I live this life in the body. But that is not the whole story. Second handle on the Christian life. Your Christian life is lived by faith in the Son of God. This Christ is for you, he's saying. This Christ is with you. His Spirit lives in your body. And what that means is that you can look to him and you can count on him in every circumstance of your life. What he's saying here then is that it is Christ's presence that makes it possible for you to live this difficult and challenging life in the body. Because Christ's power makes it possible for you to live this life with all of its struggles and with all of its difficulties. And that power is appropriated to you and by you as you exercise faith. So think with me for a moment to give an illustration here about the Metro train making its way in every morning and coming out every evening from Chicago. The train runs on twin tracks. And if you like to think about it th that way, thinking about these parallel tracks that we cross so many times, the Christian life runs on the twin tracks of these realities. You are in Christ and you are in the body. Both of these things are true so long as you are living in this world. And just as the metro train needs two tracks to get into Chicago, so you need a firm grip on these two realities in order to make sense of the Christian life. Get hold of one without the other, and you'll always be in confusion. You'll be saying, why is the Christian life as it is? Why am I so far from the realities of the Bible? The Christian life, then, is in Christ, and it is in the body. And once you grasp that, you'll begin to see and make sense of your own experience. Sin dwells in you by the flesh. Christ dwells in you by the Spirit. As long as you're living this Christian life, you're engaged in some kind of conflict with the world and the flesh and the devil. And the reason that you're able to engage in this particular struggle is that Jesus Christ lives in you. Being in Christ means that you have new life. Being in the body means that you have new battles. And that's our title today, New Life and New Battles. Now, I want you to see that these twin realities are not only in this verse. They're actually all over the Bible. Um, so let me just give you four examples. And rather than chase all over the place, I've taken the four examples from the one letter of 2 Corinthians, which if you go back just a, couple, a page, you will see that that's the letter before Galatians here. 2 Corinthians is fascinating because it is the letter more than any other where Paul opens up his own personal experience of what it was like for him to live the Christian life. And so let me just take one or two snapshots so that you can see both um, the new battle that he faces and also the new life in which he faces that battle. Ch 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verses 8 and 9 is the first of these. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse uh, 8 and uh, 9. Um, look at the new battle here. 
Paul says, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships that we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, and it was far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, in our hearts, we felt the sentence of death. Now, you see the battle written all over there. He says, to translate it another way, we were utterly, unbearably crushed. That was part of his experience of the Christian life. But notice at the same time, he then says in this verse, but this happened that we might rely, not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Now, you see the power of that? He's experiencing the new battle and the new life at precisely the same time. He is not saying, I once was in a terrible battle, but of course, now I'm in Christ, all of that is behind me. No, he's saying the new life in Jesus Christ is what made it possible for me to stand and to endure when I felt utterly, unbearably crushed, and when I felt even the sentence of death coming over my own life. New battle, new life. Turn over a couple of pages to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and two verses here, verse 11 and verse 16. Notice the battle in verse 11. We who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake. Always being given over to death. I mean, you remember how Paul speaks later in this letter about being shipwrecked and being flogged and being persecuted. I mean, this is real experience. He had the wounds in his own body to demonstrate it. But then he says, look at the life here. We're always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. The life of Christ is being evidenced in this apostle, standing up under this and continuing to serve Christ and to go on as a missionary. Verse 16, he's making the same point again, the twin realities. We do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away. So here's a Christian who physically, his body is in decline. But he says at the same time, inwardly we are being renewed day by day. There's the reality both of life in the body and the reality of life in Christ. And these two things are happening to the apostle at the same time. Turn over another couple of pages, would you? Once you start seeing this, you'll see it all over, and you'll begin to have a handle on the Christian life. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, I'm looking at verse 5. Look at the new battle. When we came to Macedonia, verse 5, this body of ours had no rest, but we were harassed. That's the apostle speaking. At every turn, conflicts on the outside, fears within. This is extraordinary. Here's a man in Christ, a man of extraordinary faith, and he's describing a particular experience that he goes through, and he says, I'm, I was harassed. I, I, I came to Macedonia. I experienced all these conflicts that were going all around me, and what was going on inside me was fear, fears within, conflicts without. That's life in the body, but notice it's never alone. Notice the new life in the very next verse. But God who comforts the downcast comforted us by the coming of Titus. Even in this, I experienced God's grace and his help, and he sent me a friend. That's what he's saying. Turn over another couple of pages, and you'll see it again. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verses 7 through 9. You may know these verses well. Here's, a, here's the battle. Verse 7. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, and three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away. Oh, God, please take away this affliction in my life. Satan's tormenting me. See, there's the conflict. There's the battle. But notice the new life. But Christ said to me, my grace, verse 9, is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. And Paul says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. So, 
This is the same apostle who on one occasion captured these things in just two phrases. He said, who is sufficient for these things? I look at my life, it all seems overwhelming. Who is sufficient for these things that I face? Well, that's life in the body, isn't it? You ever felt that? I know I have. But you see, that's one of the twin realities of the Christian life, because in the very next line he says, but our sufficiency is of God. The battle, the life, in the body, by faith, in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, once you get hold of these two firm handles on the Christian life, I think you will find this to be profoundly helpful. It will help you to make sense of your own experience. It will help you to understand the broader scriptures that you are reading when you place them within the light of this context. So, uh, let me just try and expand this a little bit. Let, let me give to you six ways in which the twin realities of the Christian life can be stated. I hope you might find at least one of these helpful. Here's one way of saying it. The Christian is at peace with God but he is at war with sin. See, a true Christian, um, someone has said, is known as much by his war as by his peace. If you think of the Christian life only in terms of, oh, well, I have peace with God, and so I should experience all this wonderful peace all the time, then you've got one handle, and you won't have a clear grasp of what the Christian life is. To be at peace with God also means that you're at war with sin. And that is why the Christian is known as much by his conflict, by his struggle, as he is by his experience of peace. Grasp one without the other, you really will never understand or make sense of the Christian life. Second, Christ lives in me by the Spirit. Sin lives in me by the flesh. See, the Christian doesn't live in sin, but sin lives in the Christian. Christian's not in the flesh, but the flesh is certainly in the Christian. It's well said in one of the songs that we sometimes sing here, in my heart there is a treason, one that poisons all my love. So, Lord, take my heart and consecrate it, wash it in your cleansing blood. There is never a day when my heart does not need the washing and the cleansing of the blood of Christ. And that's true of your heart as well. However much you've progressed in the Christian life, no Christian ever arrives in heaven because he's done well in the Christian life. Christians arrive in heaven only because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's always our dependence. Here's another way of saying the same thing. The Christian is done with sin but sin is not done with the Christian. Now, that's important when you read a passage like Romans in chapter 6 and verse 2. You know, we have died to sin, the Bible says. Or when you read um, uh, 1 John in chapter 3 and verse 9, and John says you cannot go on sinning if you've been born of God. You, you no longer sin. And yet, at the same time, um, in 1 John 1, 8, we're told if a man says that he is without sin, he deceives himself, and the truth is not in him. How are we to put these things together? Simply this way, that to be a Christian means that a decisive break has been made with sin. You are not the person you were. You are done with sin, but sin is not done with you. Let's put it another way. The Christian lives in the power of the Spirit, but he or she also experiences the weakness of the flesh. See, don't expect that the power of the Holy Spirit will make you feel on Tuesday evening, to take a random point in the week, like you are standing on the victor's podium taking your bow for your performance in the Christian life during that day. You will not have that experience. Not the side of, of heaven, and then you will be on your face and on your knees in adoration before Christ. No, the power of the Holy Spirit is what makes it possible for you to persevere in the challenges that you face on Tuesday of this week. 
to try and give this a face. A few weeks back, Karen and I spent an evening with about 20 families snapping. You know what snapping is in the life of the church? It's our parents' network for parents of children with special needs. About 20 families there, we sat in a circle and it was an incredibly moving evening for Karen and for myself to listen to each of these couples tell their story, speak about some of the burdens they were carrying and some of the joys they were experiencing. One couple uh, said with, without any particular sort of emphasis, um, as best I can repeat it, they said, you know, we're really thanking God that we have just had our first night of unbroken sleep since our son was born. So our son is 13 years old. 13 years old. Now, here's a glimpse of what the power of the Holy Spirit looks like in a believer's life. It is by the power of the Holy Spirit that these dear folks have been able to persevere in the difficulties and the demands and the pressures of which that has been just one for the last 13 years. And you can list some of the difficulties and pressures that you are facing in your life, some of the things that would make uh, a person completely turn away from any faith in God whatsoever if it was not for the power of the Holy Spirit within you. You experience the weakness of the flesh. And what then has enabled you to persevere? Nothing other than this, the power of the Holy Spirit. Here's another way of putting the same thing. See, I'm trying to settle in your mind today this one point that you grasp the Christian life with two handles. It's in the body, and it's in Christ. And you'll never understand it if you try to grasp it with only one handle. Let me put it this way then. In Christ, you are a new creation but your struggles are shaped by your experience, by your environment, and by your own temperament. See, here is this wonderful truth that when you are regenerated by the Holy Spirit, you truly do become a new creation, but it's a new you. It's still you. It's you made new, but it's, it's not another person. So it's you put in a position to deal with the stuff of your life that comes from your temperament, that comes in some ways from your experience, that comes in many ways from your environment. So this helps us to have some kind of window into what each of us are experiencing in the Christian life. All of us are tempted, but we're not all tempted in the same way. How you're tempted has an awful lot to do with your temperament. It has an awful lot to do with your background. The particular battles that each Christian faces are not exactly the same. And it has something to do with the environment as well. The spiritual dullness that comes from a comfortable Christian life is not the noticeable battle for our Christian brothers and sisters in our sister church in Haiti. Not many of them are struggling with that. Not any of them are struggling with it. But that is a battle for many of us here. Why? Because we live in the northwest suburbs. That's our battle. You're born in another part of the world, your experience will be quite different, and your battles may be quite different too. But this is one place where it's fought out for us. Here, here's another way of putting it, just trying to get the, the twin tracks of the Christian life here. Sin is no longer your master. That's wonderfully, triumphantly true of you in Jesus Christ, but sin will always be your enemy so long as you are living in this body. Wonderful statement in Romans chapter 6 and verse 14, sin shall no longer be your master, but it is always your enemy. Let me give you a picture. This has helped me, and maybe it'll help at least a few of us. Imagine a war is taking place between two armies, and picture yourself engaged in the conflict. 
here we are together, and uh, we're behind some rocks, and we're taking heavy enemy fire, and eventually our escape route is cut off, and we're surrounded, and we're captured. You surrender your weapons, and you're carted off together with the others in your unit, and eventually you arrive at a place where you're going to be imprisoned. It is like a massive cage. A whole crowd of people are already there inside. The cage is opened, you're roughly thrown in there, and uh, when you begin to get oriented to where you are, you realize that this place is being run by a man who looks absolutely terrifying. He shouts out orders, and all the people who have been there for some time do exactly what he says, and you value your life, so you decide you're going to do exactly the same. For the next year, your whole life is in the cage. You eat, you sleep, you exercise. But all the time you are under the power of the enemy, you are in the cage and you have no alternative really but to do what he says to you. And there isn't a way out. As long as you're in the cage, there is absolutely nothing you can do to overcome the enemy. Then one night as you're sleeping, you hear an extraordinary noise and a commotion. And suddenly you realize what is happening. Your captain has come, and he's brought all of his forces, and he's making an assault on the cage in order to set you free. The locks on the cage burst open. Uh, he, he, he grabs you from where you are, and together with the others, he, he, he loads you into a jeep, and off you go and up into the hills, and, and your captain then hands you a weapon. You haven't had one in your hands for a year. He says, you'll need this. You're back in the battle now. The next day, you're up there in the hills. And the man who's been running the cage, he comes out and he's looking for you. And he has all of his forces with you. And here we are, the unit. And now we're armed. And now we're out in the open. We're in an entirely different position. The man who's run the cage, of course, is shouting orders. He's got this loud hailer, and he's saying, now you come back in. You he's shouting all kinds of orders. Of course you don't pay attention to him. Why? You're not in the cage. You're free. But now you're in a battle. And he will hunt you as long as you live. And you will always need your weapon. And you must always be on your guard. And when he is gone, others will come after you. But you're not in the cage. You're free. But being free means you're in the fight. That's the point. Sin is no longer your master. You're not in the cage. That's Romans 6.14. But friends, sin will always be your enemy. You will always be fighting. This will always be your battle. And how will it be waged as long as you are in the body? It will be waged by faith in the Son of God who loves you and who gave himself for you. Now, friends, here's how you can be discerning with regards to teaching you here about the Christian life. Ask two questions about any teaching that you hear regarding the Christian life. The first question should be this, does this teaching take seriously the power of indwelling sin? You hear some teaching on the television, you read some newfangled Christian book that's come out, ask this question as you read. This teaching that I'm reading, this account of the Christian life that's being so wonderfully presented to me, does this teaching take seriously the power of indwelling sin in the Christian life? Does it take seriously that I live this life in the body, not in heaven? Second question, does this teaching take the power of the indwelling Christ seriously? Is this faithful to the power of the new life and to the presence of the Holy Spirit and to the light of hope that shines into every human life through the gospel? Does this account of the Christian life give evidence that this author, this speaker, has a firm grip of both handles, 
New life, new battles. A new freedom, but a new fight. In Christ, but in the body. So if I can put it visually for you, remembering the twin tracks of the metro going into Chicago, beware of any account of the Christian life that looks like the monorail. <laughs> beware of any teaching regarding the Christian life that looks like the monorail. You see, over the centuries, and it's still true today, there have been a line of Christian teachers who have tried to come up with an experience or a formula that would be like a silver bullet for the Christian life, some way in which you can get out of the struggle and into a higher form of the Christian life. And it may often sound like this, it's an experience of yielding to Christ, or of full surrender, or of baptism in the Spirit, or of letting go and letting God. Uh, letting God. The, the, the list goes on, and it goes on, and it goes on. What these teachings tend to have in common is that they have the same aim, and it is an attempt to resolve the tension that runs all the way through the New Testament. And the invitation is always the same. Oh, you poor ordinary Christian, on the old metra going down the twin tracks, why don't you come and join us on the shiny new monorail? 